Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Greetings to all wherever you are. With this podcast series, we are introducing exemplars for our time, an illustrated nine book set consisting of an introduction and eight concise biographies of contemporary sages within our tradition who have been role models for our community in this time. One of our aims in the Exemplars podcasts is to open a conversation about these extraordinary men and women who have historically been the benchmark of excellence for believers. I can think of no better conversationalist on this subject than our guest today. Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad needs little or no introduction. We have been friends for about 35 years, and my love and respect for him continues to deepen as time passes. Scholar, educator, lecturer, translator, publisher, activist, author, and imam, he is the founder and dean of Cambridge Muslim College and the driving force behind the construction and establishment of the Cambridge Muslim uh, Cambridge Mosque. And this is apart from his professorial responsibilities at Cambridge University and a myriad of other activities. We were both blessed to have been able to sit in the presence of Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad, who is one of the sages profiled uh, in this series, and we've remained friends for all these years. Assalamu alaikum, Sidi. Thank you for taking out, taking time out for this conversation. Uh, Um, Salam and uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to the engagement. Uh, To begin with, you you very kindly reviewed a draft of the introductory book in the series, The Luminous Virtues of the Sages of Islam, and I was deeply gratified at your assessment of the text, which was simply good. I was actually relieved. Uh, you, you and I spent many hours in the 1980s and 90s in the company of Habib Ahmed Mashhur and other Ba'alawi sages. As you know, I've written about my own experiences in Signs on the Horizons. In retrospect, what were these times like for you? Well, it's always difficult to portray in one's memory and to portray to others experiences and engagements that were essentially uh, non-verbal i suppose um yes. uh, sometimes the the traditional ulama say that uh the scholar who only improves you with his words is not a scholar and very often yeah. people find transformative experiences in being with people who say hardly anything at all so when uh, the likes of me who have just words we're wordsmiths academics operating in the two-dimensional world of uh, screens and paper try to uh, capture not just the kind of formal events and encounters, but the internal uh, alchemy of those situations. One really struggles, particularly since the modern English language has for so long lacked the capacity which traditional sacred languages certainly have for switching on in the soul of the reader certain lights so that people know intuitively what a particular person was like. Uh, the classical Islamic literature is full of enormous multi-volume works, which are biographies of the saints. I suppose your yeah. uh, Luminous Virtues books is a kind of latter-day sort of continuation of that, the tabakat, the biographies, the tarajim. It's, it's important in our heritage. But when you read those biographies, if you're not familiar with the culture and the way they operate, they all seem rather the same. It's so-and-so memorized the Qur'an by the age of seven. And then he studied mm-hmm. with Sheikh so-and-so, and he was famous for his prophetic lineage, and he was famous for his virtue and his assiduity in the yeah. outward forms of Islam, and, and, and then he died on such and such a day. And you don't really have a yeah. sense, if you're used to the Western tradition of sort of the psychodrama of the biography, it just seems to be just like a CV, really, and you don't get a sense of the... The, the, the person, but if you're familiar with that genre and you have you can cross-reference with people you've actually met, then each time one of those descriptions is included, a kind of light goes on until by the end of what seems like just a formal recital of standard accomplishments, you really get a sense of the, the temper and the quality of that person. Uh, it also seems to be the case that uh, 
to the extent that somebody has approached God, that person is without self. And so certain aspects of the personality, which are interesting to say, the librettists of operas or whatever, the, the human drama, somehow recedes. They still have personalities and individuality, but that's not really the essence of who they are. So that really puts a great strain on our capacity to express things that are essentially nonverbal and qualitative and subtle, latif. Uh, it's hard enough in the Arabic language, which has a historic you know, experience of trying to do that. Uh, but in the modern English language, uh, which has moved so far from its own kind of default sort of Christian uh, roots, uh, it's even harder, I think. And I think one of the, the challenges that such writing uh, presents is how, how in the context of an age where the sacred has been really forgotten, not just rejected as it was, say, in the 18th century, but just forgotten, people haven't got a clue, apart from a few interesting experiences and little unveilings that they might have had because the sacred, the reality of Haq is never completely veiled from human beings. The veil is never perfect. How do you explain to such people something that is so deep and so qualitative and so alien to the basic principles of their civilization, which is all about self, nafs, instrumentality, buying and selling, status, all of the things that spirituality is trying to leave behind? If, that, if the language is uh, designed only for those sort of base, two-dimensional, earthly uh, goods, then you know, how do you push it upwards? And it's, uh, it's an ongoing challenge. But it's also the case with the fitra that there is something there within every human soul that can be triggered. Um, you just need to find the right button, the right... It is, figure out the contours of people's souls and try and figure out what sort of verbal alchemy is going to convey something more than just biodata. It's a, it's a big challenge, but I think much of this Luminous Virtues book has actually managed to make the tired old English language convey something of that. It's quite an interesting, interesting cultural experiment. Yeah, I mean, it is very experimental. Um, I mean, the premise of the series is that one of the major contributing factors in the rise of extremism, which is something that you've been addressing for many years, has been the absence of role models mm -hmm. who in traditional Islam were these saints and sages. And to be honest, I'm a reclusive scribbler who's had minimum contact with mainstream Muslim societies for more or less a half a century. And you, on the other hand, have been on the front lines for decades. Mm -hmm. Are we missing something? Uh, is there something that, that's, that we could add to this uh, narrative or this conversation? Well, it depends on what view you take of the various psychic and cultural evolutions that the mainstream Ummah might have been through in the last 50 years. Uh, to make an analogy, should, say, the Islamic arts, visual arts, calligraphy, ornamentation, decoration of various kinds, ceramics perhaps, reflect those psychic evolutions which the Ummah has experienced and convey something of the brokenness and the rupture that people feel in order to be authentic? Or is it still worth providing perfect replicas of the artifacts of an age of faith in the hope that that is still powerful enough in the language, mm -hmm. universal language of beauty to, to grab people. So I think there's something to be said for being a recluse insofar as perhaps one is in a time warp to some extent, uh, recalling people who are from an earlier, they're not medieval generation when things were clearer and deeper. And perhaps the, the fact that that recollection has been central to one's understanding and personal engagement with Islam makes what one says actually more countercultural, more edgy, more surprising, more, more attractive than something that is just trying to build on the, uh, uh, the shifting sands of, of the, the modern discursive reality. Yeah, I, I think... Um the the, um, the absence the, the absence of ego which you you mentioned is seems to be a key to uh, the, the experience you know to um, the the healing experience of sitting with these people is that you 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I know that you experienced this with Habib uh, Ahmed and and with Sayyid Omar Abdullah, who we we knew at the time as well. I mean, these people, their the ego is kind of not there, and it's a, it's a it's something that's difficult to mm-hmm. to describe. But it it certainly for me it changed me, and I wasn't looking for some I wasn't looking for something historical when I encountered Islam for the first time, uh, I just stumbled into the presence of these people. And then I thought, whoa, I, the, these are the people, these are human beings, mm-hmm. you know, that I, I want to be like, I want, I want to emulate them. Um, it, it, do you think that that's out of reach now for most people? I don't think it can be because uh, however, suffocated it might be by the product addiction that has been imposed on just about everybody uh, the ruh is still there and still operative yeah. it's a, a pure diamond on which mountains of refuse and chemical waste has been loaded yeah. but it's still there because in its nature it is from the divine and it's incorruptible so uh, you just need to find people who haven't taken the, the modern mythology that seriously. And there's plenty of mm-hmm. dissidents and skeptics and uncomfortable people who are not happy with the story that the, the Cathedral of Modernity is, is preaching to them. And also, I think it raises a very interesting, perhaps unanswerable question of uh, to what extent are we still in touch with fitra in the Islamic language or primordiality? Because one thing that the archaeologists tell us is that the oldest stuff that they ever excavate that's related to human beings is always religious stuff. The oldest Mm. building is in Turkey and it's like 12,000 BC and it's a temple. This is even before agriculture. (laughs) People were building temples. They're always grave goods going back 50,000, 60,000 years. Human beings have always been homo religiosus. They've always had a sense of the transcendent. And in primordial societies, that doesn't just mean realizing that there is a reality behind the amazing surface of nature, but also that there are certain transformed individuals who've been on a vision quest, who've been fully initiated, who've passed on Mm -hmm. just about every primordial people from the Native Americans to uh, New Guinean forest dwellers to everybody have had that sense that the signs are of the divine reality, however, strangely and differently that might be articulated in human language, are not just in virgin nature, but are also in certain transformed human beings who are the medicine man, the shaman, the seer, the wise elder, the wise woman. Just about every culture has had that. And those are not secular qualities. Those are individuals who are always mediating the sacred. So that could be said to be part of human nature, uh, just as the love of nature itself is part of human nature and goes way back beyond the industrial revolution. But when we are in the presence of real beauty or of virgin nature, or sometimes the presence of animals, say horses, whatever it might be, we feel something very ancestral is triggered within us and we feel a certain peace sitting by a log fire or something. We feel connected to something that's indefinable but is there because it's how our ancestors for 100,000 years were living. So if we can add to those ex- initiatic experiences that modern people still kind of recognize when they go off on their retreats or whatever it is that they're up to um, in order to try and fill the hole left by the Christian God, that if we can add to that the possibility that the vision quest, uh, the realized sage, the medicine man, the person whose very presence conveys through a stillness a kind of radiance that is completely consonant with the radiance that we intuit in nature, then that can be activated very quickly. But you have to speak to people generally in terms that don't sound like organized religion because people are so alienated from it because of what religion has turned into in the last 100, 150 years. But the human longing for the realized sage for the saintly, seer, whatever, um, is I think something that's hardwired into our brains and and can always be activated. So uh, we need we need to have some sort of uh, discrimination for for young people because there is an interest among 
many young people today, as you well know, in finding a spiritual guide. And I'm I'm speaking specifically of Muslims, but it's true uh, beyond Islam. Uh, But I, I think that there's a widespread misunderstanding of what that relationship is and how it works uh, or even if you should have it in the first place, and how should young people approach spirituality and the search for a guide in this time, which is very confusing, particularly with the you know um, digital communications and the internet and all of the confusion that comes along with mm-hmm. that. Uh, how, how should we? How should young people proceed? Because this is the question I get. Uh, all the time, because mainly because of the things that I've written, uh, as if I know the answers to, uh, to all these questions. But it's a, it's um, it, it must be something that you also um, uh, you also experience among some of the young people. Yeah. Well. Uh, There are many paths to initiatic wisdom, and the wide road has always been the traditional formal vision quest and taking the hand of a perfect guide who will then communicate the unseen, unexpressible haqiqah of the the founder, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But God's lordly generosity doesn't have to be limited to that. And one finds people nowadays, not very often, but sometimes, who genuinely have been touched by the divine and are transformed and transformative people, often people who are living semi-reclusive lives, I've found, um, uh, who don't seem to have had a formal connection in the classical sense, but who may have some kind of, to us, enigmatic relationship with somebody who has passed on somebody Mm -hmm. whose spiritual guide appears in dreams, but who physically died in the 17th or the 18th century, for instance. And that seems to be a pattern that the guide can appear in dreams. And I know people who find that to be a sufficient sustenance. Uh, Or you can find people who are just the sort of soft majdub individuals who have been given uh, an immediate and undeniable unveiling of the divine name Al-Qarib, the near, which sustains them throughout their lives. And they wish that they could have the sohbah and the companionship and the mechanics of the social uh, safety net that the tariqah represents, the kind of virtuous ummah within the wider ummah, but they can't find it. Or perhaps temperamentally, they're just individualists. But um, as, as you gain people's confidence, people from an indefinite range of of backgrounds, you do find that even though access to formal, traditionally accredited and initiated guides seems to be harder now than ever before, nonetheless, the divine closeness, which is just an infinitesimal distance behind the surface of things, breaks through and is merciful to people, guides them, illuminates them. Uh, Sometimes that can be poorly controlled, But if people are respectful of the Sharia boundaries, then there's a limit to how much damage it can do if it comes as a result of self-emptying, because it can never come as the result of some kind of quest for the true self or the ego or these these new age things, Mm self-discovery. Sufism says, leave the self behind. It's the opposite of the the new age um, self-discovery, self-vaunting, ideology and it takes a lot of modern people a long time to get beyond that because they've been brought up to believe that in the absence of god and the church and philosophy even in post the postmodern drift of late reality of western civilization that all that remains is the self and the body mm. so everything becomes my body how i look what i desire who i desire what gender am i body 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 uh, and the self in the kind of, I don't know, Meghan Markle style, everything is about the self and what I feel and what I know. And that's the kind of Fir'aun rather than the Musa. That's Nimrod, not Ibrahim. It's the opposite of 
the prophetic thing, which is that the self is, watch out, it's a snare, it's a trick, it's an illusion, and every sacred tradition has insisted on that. So modernity, if it's describable by anything, could be characterized as uh, the positioning of ego in the place where the spirit ought to be, the giving it of all the authorities which it doesn't naturally possess in its waywardness and its willfulness and its self-orientation and its vanity and its insecurities and its fears, the the part of us that gives us headaches, that's the self now. That's what we are because there's no access or no recollection of the existence of a real self. So people have to be de-educated, really, deprogrammed and told actually the self, the the whole culture, uh, from primary school to Disney to presidents to everything has told you is what you are. It's not even real. And uh, you need to move away from that unreality that nonetheless is dangerous because it's full of desires and um, all the rest of it, instincts, it's gravitational. You need to leave behind that which modernity tells you is your reality. And once it's gone, then something else will happen, which is more or less guaranteed because the only veil over the ruh is the ego. If the ego's gone, then you're you're sorted again. You're a, a normal human being. You've recovered your Adamic status. And all the world's spiritualities have said this, get rid of self, get rid of ego, get rid of that self-orientation uh, because it's dark, instinctual, self-oriented when it doesn't really exist, properly speaking. It's illusion, waham, and come to reality. Be your real self, which is actually a reflection of the divine self. It's the breath blown into Adam. Uh, So people need to be re-educated as to what spirituality is. It's not a journey of self-discovery. You discover yourself only to leave it behind. You think, ugh, that's repulsive. That's right. stopping everything, and you trample it underfoot, and then you start your mirage. That, in my experience, is the main difficulty people have, that the false counter-initiatic spiritualities of today have inverted this. And the American Muslim writer Charles Upton has a whole book on this. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, Vectors of the Counter-Initiation. No, I, 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 I certain modern, two perfect inversions of what spirituality is supposed to be. It's very interesting Somewhat alarming read, I would say, but um, he's, he's seen this. Um, I, 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 send me, send me his the, the name of the book. I need to need to read that. Um, it, it, for us, we we came into uh, Islam uh, in fifty years ago, so the the, the world was a really remar- yep. you know actually remarkably different place for, uh, than it is now. Um, it's hard to believe that, but it, it was. But this 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 um, universal um, uh, battle against the self was was always there, but for us it, the the solution was very simple: is that you displace the uh, awareness of the self with awareness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala through the the act of dhikr Allah and the, the recitation of Quran and through. Uh, obedience to the Sharia and so on, and it hasn't really changed, has it? I mean, it's the same. It's the same thing. Or in your in your um, in in your estimation, is, is there something else that people need to attend to now that we're in the century of the self? Well, yeah, half a century is a long time, particularly in the modern world where everything is constantly reconfiguring itself and yesterday's taboos become today's orthodoxies and it's very disruptive. Um, And of course, the whole uh, discourse about Islam has changed. Back in the 70s, most people didn't really have the usual contemporary stereotypes about Islamic this and Islamic that. Um, when I became Muslim, I don't think there'd ever been a single act of Islamist terror ever anywhere. Right. And it, it didn't occur to us that such a thing could exist. It seemed like yeah. the obvious impossibility. Now it's the main thing that people associate with the religion that is the matrix of these sages and of Sufism. That has made things a lot harder 
uh, particularly with non-Muslims who only know the media, kind of the cathedral's image of uh, the Islamic world. That's a major veil to get through. And sometimes you have to do it, as I say, by mentioning primordiality, uh, uh, timeless human needs, the timelessness of human nature, and then the Islamic stuff has to be introduced to them once they've understood you know, the mess that modern humanity is in. That has made things a lot worse. Um, the fact that in the Muslim world also you have had this uh, very foolish uh, belief that the best way to deal with the challenges of modernity is to make everything much narrower and tighter, which is possibly yes. the most stupid decision in the history of any world religion. Obviously, modernity provides people with more temptations and more oddities than ever before. You know, this is worse than Nero's Rome. This is every conceivable thing because it's it's two clicks away. Every human freakishness is two clicks away from every 12-year-old, and this yeah. is new. Uh, under those circumstances, and given the perennial weakness of human beings, we need to be more merciful. We need to be more forgiving. We need to show people more beauty more compassion. We need to introduce them to the Sufi principle that they should always be looking for the best in people and in things and instinctively not looking at what is impure and dirty. And uh, But unfortunately, the Ummah, in a state of panic very often uh, because of this kind of apocalyptic antichrist culture that it feels is overwhelming them, thinks that the solution is to curl up like a hedgehog into a kind of prickly ball and to follow the narrowest possible interpretations because that reduces the chances of compromise. And whether you call it fundamentalism or Islamism or whatever, it doesn't really matter because it exists in Shiism as well as in Sunnism. It's a general ummah-wide reflex that the way to deal with modernity is to become as narrow-minded as possible. <laughs> That's not in any of the books of Islamic jurisprudence. It's obviously a psychological reflex. But it does make everything a lot harder because people are in such a fearful. The repudiation of tasawwuf as a, as a uh, as an active part of Islam, as an intrinsic part of Islam. You gave a, a wonderful uh, lecture uh, in Europe, someplace I can't remember exactly where, uh, and the title was "Can you be an Orthodox Sunni Muslim uh, and uh, and uh, be a, a Sufi or?" without Sufism? And your answer was, uh, was no. And it was a very, uh, it's, it's a, I mean, this is what we were dealing with 50 years ago, because the, mm -hmm. this was the dominant, um, uh, the dominant uh, narrative uh, that Sufism was Bida and uh, uh, it was, um, uh, it, it was uh, uh, an innovation and, and shouldn't be followed. Yeah, that also, I think, adds to people's sense of sort of kind of beleaguered panic, because if you go into any Islamic manuscript library, like I was once in Timbuktu, one of the centers of Islamic scholarship in West Africa, visiting some libraries, and they were with me a couple of people from the desert, Tuareg young men, who'd converted to some form of Salafist fundamentalism. And we walked through these amazing libraries, which constituted yeah. the collective loving work of hundreds of years of their ancestors. And they just ended up being furious because they couldn't agree with a single book, <laughs> except the Qur'ans. But the Qur'ans were a Warsh recitation yeah. that they didn't really think was appropriate either. So that that is a very difficult state for Muslims who think that Sufism is not part of Islam because... There's, there's 74 full commentaries on Sahih al-Bukhari, the Hadith collection. Every single one is absolutely full of Sufism and Sufi quotes and Sufi sages. It's just normative. It's pretty universal. So they've self-exiled. Uh, so not only are they exiled from the modern world because it's secular and doesn't appreciate religious people, but they're also exiled from the narrative of Islamic civilization which they can't believe in any longer. They think it went fundamentally wrong. And that's one reason why you see such extreme manifestations of panicky violence and things that really have never been seen before in Islamic history. Some of the stuff that happened in Syria, for instance, it's a kind of despair at the fact that 
the Umbert is being categorically mistaken. So, um, fifty years ago, as you as you mentioned, uh, there was no real prejudice. It was, Islam was an unknown quantity, and then it became known through various iterations of of terrorism or uh, as a threatening presence. Um, and that has been a, a created a big change. But when we started out, um, the 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 big problem was that Sufism was considered to be separate from Islam because the dominant narrative had been controlled by um, uh, the reformists and and, and the fundamentalist forces in Islam uh, as a result of all kinds of you know the his, historical you know the colonial. Uh, defeat and, and and the fall of Muslim power and so on, uh, but today it's it's something different. I mean, is it seems to me that there's a wider acceptance of tasawuf among among young people that because they're searching for, particularly young people in the West, who who have this second generation, third generation Muslims who've had many of the or most of the benefits of being in a in a developed society, um, but um, it, the, the, it seems to me that the, the, the many young people are really confused. They they don't know which way to go, and they're they're told that there there are these spiritual teachers, and then you have you know uh, you have gurus online, and uh, you, you know. Um, then, then there's what they, people have called spiritual abuse, and so there's a question of spiritual authority, and um, uh, it's hard to dismiss it. You know, in one in one sense, uh, it's it's um, it's something that's that is part of our tradition. Has always been part that, that people become disappointed with one teacher or another, um, um, but now it seems to be more traumatic. In your experience, how how do you deal with something like that? You know, if you have a young young person coming who feels traumatized by being let down by a teacher or uh, something something like that, it seems to me that there's a misunderstanding of what the whole matter is is really about. Well, historically, uh, if one attached oneself to a spiritual mentor that person would be likely to be part of one's community, probably known to one's family, known to neighbours, and somebody who could be externally assessed. Uh, It was, although it sometimes happened, relatively rare for people to travel to different uh, distant lands in order to find spiritual guides because they were very abundant. Uh, Nowadays, where uh, one's own network may be damaged, traumatized, or simply not aware of how to assess these things, or one is looking for a spiritual guide who turns up on Zoom in some town in southern Africa or whatever, and one doesn't really have anything other than a two-dimensional and partial impression of what that person is. And of course, some people will will be taken for a ride, but this is just uh, uh, the the most valuable things are also the most risky things. Uh, learning you know, accountancy or something. Well, if you get your sums wrong, you might end up in jail, but there's a limit to how much spiritual danger it, damage it can do to you. But if you're looking for somebody who is going to take you from yourself to God, that which is what human beings are for, really, the highest, highest quest... Uh, then because it involves some of the most intimate and vulnerable parts of your psyche, then the risks are greater. To some extent, it's equivalent to marriage, for instance. People can go into marriage with tremendous naivety, optimism, vulnerability, and when they get hurt, especially women, I imagine, they get really hurt much more than they would get hurt in any other kind of relationship where they're not kind of so uh, exposed. So... uh, there has to be an awareness in Muslim communities that uh, the availability of spiritual guides is not part of some kind of consumer uh, supermarket culture that you can yeah. just Google and find the right kind of person or hearsay or somebody who's got a lot of followers on Twitter. It's a completely different qualitative thing. And it's ultimately about uh, the divine guidance 
uh, and it is God who will take you to your guide. And people should be, of course, wary of anything that doesn't look Sharia compliant. That should be the first criterion. Yeah. If somebody is uh, not really following what is known to be part of the religion in terms of outward practices and boundaries, then run a mile, of course, because uh, that person has a completely inverted understanding of what a disciplined initiation is about. But yeah, it's an age in which everybody is confused, everybody is disconsolate, uh, but people are very aspirational because they're brought up with this kind of American dream mindset that you can do it, you can get it, you can realize your dream, and people don't like to be disappointed, which is human nature, but particularly in our achievement-oriented age, it's particularly painful for people. But if you can just love God, say your prayers, love the saints, experience nature, recognize your ego and try and overcome it as much as you can by love for others and service, then even if you don't have a formal spiritual guide, inshallah, you will be shown things, uh, various tajalliyat will be unveiled to you. And that's more normal than abnormal, I would say. And those things will sustain you. What is you, your estimation of, of um, the community, like the, the, the European community in terms of their uh, um, general health is it is it is it um, is it hopeful in any way i mean the european muslim community yeah i mean in, in england in europe um, because this is the this is has been your focus for a very long time yeah i mean each country has a different dynamic um mm there isn't really a European Islamic reality. Uh, France, Germany, Russia, Ireland, they're all really very different. Uh, one sees uh, you know, a wide range of things. Some of the most active Sufi tariqas, which seem to be growing recently, <coughs> uh, sometimes seem a little bit formulaic as well as formalistic insofar as they yeah. insist on the preservation the replication of forms of dhikr and ceremonies which were really designed by illuminated souls for very different cultures there is a lack of yeah. enculturation and the sufis are always enculturated uh, with yeah. say you know, i've been to shadily dhikr is in brussels and everything is in Arabic and the way it's done back in Morocco, if everybody there still has a, li a living conception of Morocco, then it kind of makes sense. But for the newer generation, for the converts, it adds a, a, an element of alienation and exoticism, which I think is really holding things back. It becomes a kind of uh, dressing up party somehow. People get into a different cultural space and do certain things that are very disconnected from their daily lives and reality. I think that's really holding things back, a kind of nationalism that affects the tariqas and their forms. Uh, but you also see a, a larger number of interesting books, of publishing houses, of people who are reflecting intelligently on how Islam relates to modernity. 50 years ago, those books really hardly existed. Um, there was almost yeah, nothing, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. as you probably recall. And what there was yeah. was kind of dismaying. <laughs> uh, but now, yeah, there's, well, there's, there's enough to read. Uh, Not in I all recall, European language. I, I recall that we had a visit from Sheikh Mohammed Ashraf, if you recall the Ashraf yep. publications, which were sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the pa pages were upside down or was missing a cover mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And he came in and it was like a rock and ro rock star had walked into the room because this was these this is this was the sort of uh, uh, piece of, of, of uh, flotsam that we were holding on to to learn yeah. our Islam at that time. The, the, just we had Muhammad Ashraf and then the um, the uh, Brill publications and uh, Luzak and, that, mm -hmm. and that, that was more or less it. So it's, there's been so, I mean, you've been part of that publishing renaissance with the Quilliam Press and, and uh, then there's the ITS mm -hmm. and, and Fons Vitae and 
any other number of of, uh, of uh, publishers. So, so it, that is a wonderful thing. The uh, number of books there was almost, except for Ashraf, there was no Al Ghazali published, as far as I remember. So this is very, very, very new development. So that's a good thing. But um, if let's say there's a young person, you know, coming into Islam, what what should they do to begin with? What do you what 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 would you say to a new Muslim? Who is? Uh, where where should they go? Where what where should, what should they study? Who should they sit with? I mean, which if it's a new Muslim probably don't go to the mosques because people <laughs> well-meaning people will crowd around you with different things to read and different things to be certain mm-hmm. about, and you'll be almost torn limb from limb by people dragging you in different directions. Or the mosque is very culturally specific and they can't relate to you because you're not from a particular region of Turkey or whatever it might be. So mosques are not really a good port of call for most converts. They're very challenging. Okay, so uh, we don't they really go? have a proper... Uh, they should go within, really. Uh, they should have a habit of reading. They should uh, try and connect with a... Uh, uh, a body of literature and with gatherings that are of a particular, evidently normative uh, lineage. Uh, mm. They should read Imam Ghazali, they should read Rumi, uh, they should try not to work too hard and become kind of mentally congested as a result of stresses of work. Um, and they should not be too over ambitious about what can be achieved in a very kind of dark and uh, Zulmani era of human history. If people can just do the basics and love humanity and love God, then inshallah they're saved and Allah in his absolute wisdom and discretion can open things for them that we might call mystical. Um, but that's never guaranteed. Even if you have a great sheikh, that might not happen. So yeah, don't don't try and bite off more than you can chew. Don't yeah. assume that you can listen to everybody uncritically. Remember that there is no church hierarchy. You're not forced to belong to a parish or to listen to the authoritative voice of your local bishop. Islam is quite a good context for freelancers. If you can find the luminous spiritual guide, then yeah, that's the, the philosopher's stone, the Kibrit Ahmar, that turns the leaden heart into gold. But there's also other possibilities in the divine discretion for people to make real spiritual progress, even if outwardly they don't feel that they've managed to find such a person. Mm. Uh, the um, uh, with w- without company, though, it's it, maintaining your it one's Islam would be is is very very difficult. It would seem to me. I mean, I've always, even though I'm I tend to be reclusive. I have many, many uh, mm-hmm. close uh, friendships, which have sustained me through fifty years of, of practice as a Muslim. Um, yeah. To to be completely alone, and so then the natural place that most people would be um, gravitating to would be the mosque. But as you rightly point out, they tend to be conflict zones, or or as you mentioned, race. T- Race temples, which is yeah. uh, that must have got the, that the, that expression must have had had a few res, um, responses from from the well, community. I mean, the reality is imagine. that if you're say a West Indian convert and you go into an Arab mosque or a South Asian mosque in England, you're likely to have bad experiences. It's yes, just, and this yes. is outrageous in Islam where. Bilal is the muazzin and the tribalism is abolished, but it's still a kind of axiom for many Muslim communities in the West. Yeah, and yeah. it has to be called out. We can't just be forgiving yeah. towards them. They're violating a fundamental principle of Islamic universalism. Right. Um, and the other point that I, I, I think you, you make in traveling home, which I recommend to any, anyone to anyone to buy this book and read it carefully it's beautifully written and it's it's, it's actually very exhilarating to read um 
is is that, that Muslims uh, are, should be at home everywhere. That you know uh, that yep. that wherever we are is our home. We can pray anywhere. Uh, we don't have to pray mm-hmm. in the mosque. Um, and uh, you, you know the, this is this is something that I think that needs to be more widely um, uh, articulated because uh, it, it's something. Uh, Muslims, I, I know even my own children who are half Arab, part Arab, they 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 felt um, they felt isolated and foreign in Arab countries, and they felt isolated and foreign in in their home country, uh, which yep. is not really what what's supposed to happen. So, uh, um, it's it's. Um, uh, it's something. The other thing that I wanted to sort of bring up is what about women? I mean, this is a big issue now uh, because we live in a more liberal uh, environment, and women uh, have been uh, been not neglected, but they 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 they've been uh, uh, they're they're not present. Or they're, I mean, the women aulia particularly. Uh, I, I asked uh, Muli Hashim Belriti about this. I said, well, how can we find women Aulia? And he just laughed. He said, it's hard enough to find men Aulia. He said, it's impossible to find women Aulia. How, where do they f- uh, fit in the scheme of things? Uh, I think that historically they have been very abundant, but given the discretion of traditional Muslim family life, they haven't been kind of out and public figures the way the men have. Right. Uh, their style is more family-oriented, neighbourhood-oriented, local gatherings. It's an interior and private style of wilaya. It's not public irshad. But I, I suspect on the basis of my own probably random uh, experience that there are more women around in Muslim communities who seem to be really spiritually advanced than there are men. Um, The kind of semi-solitary women who are given over to ibadah and worship and the love of humanity. Yeah, I think that there are more than there are men. I think modernity damages the male temper because women, they're more involved in their bodies. Uh, It's harder for them to move far from their fitra the women always have that relationship with their cyclicity, their fertility, child, the whole miracle of the, of, of the womb, which the Qur'an speaks about. And therefore, it seems that it's harder for them to get away from the fitra and be completely subverted by modernity. So fewer of them go to prison, fewer of them get involved in drug gangs, fewer of them really seem to suffer from uh, pathological now, how many female um, school shooters have there been in, in the US, for instance? I can't think of one. But that's an example of the deep and, spiritual malaise that's affecting the male psyche nowadays. So, uh, yeah, I think that this is an age in which the, the female spiritual aptitude, which has always been you know, real, and the Quran speaks of spiritual women, uh, is in a, in a strange kind of way coming into its own. But it does tend to be... A rather private and secluded. It's individual women who are withdrawn from the world just just to worship and to to read and to to contemplate. And some of them, you know, they've evidently reached uh, real degrees of the experiential closeness with with their creator. Well, I can attest to this because um, when the signs of the horizons came out, and then this the other the the next book. Uh, in every uh, reading that I've had or an encounter I've had with an audience, I would say that 60 to 70 percent of the audience are women. And I, I yeah. saw this in, in once the first time I, I noticed this was in Rumi's cave. This was years ago. Mm-hmm. I walked in and there were there were uh, the, 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 the room was full of women and they had the books and they were, you know, they had these um like you know these little uh, little uh, the, these the books were all marked with uh, tabs yep. and they were yep. studying it and there were just a, a, a scattering of men but mostly women and it was it, it really stunned me 
um, and then that, that's that's proven to be sort of the um, the the norm now. You know, I I I've, I went into I went to a, a gathering in uh, in Kuala Lumpur, and the the whole mm-hmm. almost the whole auditorium was filled with women. Uh, so. Um, it's it's well, interesting, yeah, right? Unless it's your own personal charisma, of course. Yeah. No, I, I hardly. I, but, uh, I, I don't. I hardly. Yeah, but we need to acknowledge this reality, and it's it's said often, particularly in the Sufi tradition. Mahidin ibn Arabi, you know, has a very mm. high view of the spiritual capacity and representationality of women, and he says his first three initiatic teachers in the path were all women. So our tradition can accommodate this. It's not a kind of crisis or a sign of a breakdown. It's you know, we, This is the age of women in many ways. Uh, the university where I teach, over 60% of undergraduates now are women, and that number's going up, and this is how things are. And evidently, Tasawwuf and the traditions of Islam are still speaking to those often quite powerful, educated, autonomous women. It still uh, is drawing them. Are you are you still having any uh, pushback for your advocacy of Tasawwuf, um, you know, in 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 in, in your um, public speaking, and because you know, you've been very open about that, uh, are you getting any any well, criticism people, or? I, I never read those YouTube comments. Um, <laughs> right, uh, I don't really see the point, um, and in. Uh, the the Cambridge Mosque, it's very kind of inclusive in the sense that we don't do or say anything that anybody might regard as arguable. We just stick to the basics. Um, That seems to work, and it's created a really good atmosphere of mutual trust. The Shia come, everybody comes. Oh, really? So we don't have a kind of public mulling, for instance, in 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 the mosque itself, because not everybody might be comfortable with that. And I think in the mosques, that's important. There shouldn't be Sufi mosques. That's kind of not what a mosque is. Sufi things happen in a different space in Islamic civilization. But yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of nature sayers and shouters, but um, I just don't, uh, I don't find it very interesting, really, because those people don't know much. No, they're, just try- they're just on a journey. They're trying to find an identity, trying to find some kind of certainty that they think is rigorous and authentic. And the subtler, deeper things of religion may not immediately speak to them. They're more concerned with looking for boundaries in order to deal with the chaos of their lives and and the world. I don't think one should be angry with them or just just feel sorry for them because they're missing so much of the, the richness that Islam has always been. Yes, and, and I think that there seems to be a re- recession of, of of this kind of thinking uh, in, across the uh, the world. It doesn't seem. Yeah. I mean, it reached its high pitch with ISIS in twenty fifteen. Yeah. I think that just it just went over the top, and finally people realized yeah. what what this whole thing was leading to. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, was you, 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 I was in Frankfurt uh, recently. And they said, you know, the, the the Salafis have all gone. And I said, how can they have well, gone? And they said, 400 Muslims from Frankfurt went to fight in Syria. Hardly anybody's come back. And so the mosques well, are really great now. We don't have those kind of <laughs> argumentative, shouty people. Everything's really nice. And we call it the drain. I can't remember the German word for it. It's a kind of thing drained away. And the community is kind of uh, much happier, they said, as a result. Yes. I mean, Sayyid Omar Abdullah, uh, back in the day, he he was saying that in East Africa, when the Salafis came in to East Africa, within two years, everyone was at each other's throats. Before that time, there was a general harmony, and uh, it would be wonderful to to achieve that uh, once again. Um, I I have been listening with some interest to your Paradigms of um, Leadership series, which um, mm-hmm. you profile great, great uh, figures, great individuals. And I was very particularly taken with the, the uh, talk on Shahid al-Faridi, who 
was someone who always fascinated yep. me, and I, I wish that I had uh, been able to meet him before he passed away. I mean, what an extraordinary human being! And, and these 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 stories that that you tell of the lives of these people, I think it's it's very important. I mean, do, uh, you, obviously, you think you you think the same thing. I, I think we. We need to reintroduce storytelling. It's one of the, um, I, th I think the, the difficulties now is we, it, we don't have that many people who can tell a story. It's, it's, something, it's something we faced in this, with the series itself. We had, I had to reject five texts and, and the, principally because the, the scholars who were you know, commissioned to, to write the texts uh, didn't know how to tell a story, so they, they were they, they you know they understood the subject they they knew in, in most cases they knew the individual, but they just didn't know how to make something uh, write something that was dramatic and that that, that kept the attention yeah. of the reader. It's very academic and mm -hmm. flat. Um, and uh, I mean, I, it would seem to me that this is something that needs to be encouraged in some way. I, uh, 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 what, I mean, what what this is uh, presumably this is why you under, undertaken this series, which is very extensive, very impressive. Yeah, I guess so. And I think people listen more carefully when they're listening to real stories about real human beings and it's yeah. because we're in a culture which is all about drama and uh tv uh crime series and everything is a narrative that is a kind of page turn or a cliffhanger people are used to to that in their secular lives and i think if you can introduce that into religious discourse people pay much closer attention than if you're just talking about discussions about the divine attributes or the Ashari view of free will, where people will dutifully follow you, but it's not the same as learning about the real life human being. And the Umma is so diverse and amazing that there's uh, uh, an embarrassment of riches, really. There's thousands and thousands of people whose lives could be told. Um, it's, it's such a huge geographical area, a long historic period. One of the, um, the, the the things that comes out in in the, the biographies that we we did and and your stories as well uh, um, is is the hardship that many of these people go through uh, because you you imagine I mean that you, you, one can could possibly imagine that that uh, because someone is saintly that their that life is easy but life is actually has. Mm -hmm. it, very, very uh, challenging, very difficult, yeah. and, and, and tr even traumatic for many of many of these people. And I think that's a very important message to to get across that, that these they're people, they're human beings. They 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 go through the same things we all do. And and this is what biography yeah. teaches all of us. If you read a bio, uh, uh, most biographies, they people go through terrible trials uh, individuals uh, and the, the more prominent they are the, the bigger the trial the episode on uh, Ivan Agueli for instance which is in that series I mean a man of so many misfortunes and eventually dies mysteriously and tragically in poverty even though he'd achieved so much um, you know, mm. no I haven't I haven't but I will no I make a point of yeah. That's an, it's an interesting yeah. story. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're full of stories. And I, I think you pointed out the fact that people are really engulfed in storytelling on television, on, on, on YouTube, on, on, uh, yeah. uh, in movies and, and novels and books. And we, we need to fill in a certain gap so that people... Uh, can can read something that that is fascinating, but not necessarily uh, uh, depraved or profane, mm -hmm. which is you know the, the basically what what you get the the, um, the content yeah. that you get in, in in mainstream media. It's 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 frightening. 
um, do, do you, uh, is there do you, is there any um, I mean, is is there any academic initiative that you know of that where whereby young aspiring young Muslim writers could actually learn uh, the craft of writing? Uh, Not the, the formal context. initiatives, as, far as I know. Um, there's a few individuals who I trust to whom I refer people who want a bit of online tuition with their poetry or their short stories or whatever. Um, but no, it's not really an academic discipline, I think, even though universities sometimes have courses in creative writing, but it's more qualitative yes. and artistic than scholarly, I think. Yeah. It, it would be, it would be um, very useful, I think, uh, to have something like a, I, whatever it is, like seminars or something where young, young people can learn to communicate in a way that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's accessible to a general public. Uh, we need that, I think. Uh, and uh, anyway, I think, I think we've, you know, covered a, a lot of territory and I'm, I'm really grateful that you, uh, that you've been able to take the time and uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, grateful for our friendship and I hope we can, meet again person to person rather than digitally. <laughs>